uh, a reminder uh, about Larry Seaver, who was a, a wonderful contributor and um, uh, major uh, inspiration for the development of this field. Um, I knew him when he was a resident, and uh, uh, he worked with me for the first two, three years of his career. And uh, he was then, as he was forever, sort of a quick-witted, slow-speaking guy who um, was um, generally uh, prodding me to get with uh, whatever was new going on. That I, he wanted to bring me into the 20th century, so we miss him. The, pro the subject of this talk are training implications of a generalist model for treating borderline personality disorder. And let me begin by highlighting the public health significance of this. Um, the borderline uh, people represent a 2 to 3 percent of the population. That's a huge fraction of the population. Well, you, you think, well, it's only 2 to 3 percent, but that is millions and hundreds of millions of people, and um, that is, it means that really almost nobody will have gone through their life without contact with uh, multiple people with this disorder. Um, it's roughly 15 to 20 percent, and probably that percentage, Mary has pointed out to me, of the hospital admission, psychiatric hospital admission, is probably going up because a lot of conditions are more now treated more successfully as outpatients, and the requirements for getting into hospitals have become more stringent, and it oftentimes requires a patient who is in very desperate straits in order to breach that threshold. In any event, the uh, 15 to 20 percent of the psychiatric uh, outpatient clinic and admissions is an amazing fraction of the mental health burden. Um, and uh, getting on to my subject, the burden is on the mental health professions to train ourselves to treat these people. They represent 9% of emergency room visits, all emergency room visits. This is not psychiatric emergency rooms. When you think of the whole spectrum of medical care and all the people who come to emergency rooms, that's a huge percentage. And 6% of primary care visits, uh, where they occupy a great deal more than 6% of the primary care physician's times, time. Yeah. That is a summary of sort of the visible public health uh, demands and the health care utilization of borderline patients. By far the greater costs associated with this disorder are those which are called indirect costs, which have to do with the things that damages these people cause, and first and foremost has been their ongoing failures to find productive employment. Uh, and beyond that, the damaging relationships, custody fights, caretaking, uh, the, the problems they create for their kids, the burden on families, um, the uh, high frequency of uh, divorce and um, um, forensic problems, as well as a marked increase in medical disorders, which has been documented now in several studies. Um, all of this is by way of background for what I want to talk about, which is this is a public health problem of such dimensions that uh, there is a need for our society and certainly the mental health professions to take this on, take the challenges on and to train the next generation of clinicians uh, to be able to manage these people uh, effectively. The lack of treaters for borderline patients has many sources. Um, uh, one of them is active avoidance. Um, uh, 
Don Black will recall, and maybe some others that, uh, I think it was like 25 years ago, Bruce Full engineered some kind of survey which showed that 70% uh, of uh, the clinicians polled actively avoided um, and disliked, and or disliked borderline patients. Now there had been a recent uh, survey of American psychiatrists which suggested that 40% of um, uh, modern American psychiatrists um, actively avoid these patients when they can and do not give the diagnosis even when they know it's there. Um, these speak to the active avoidance of the patients and behind that the stigma of untreatability and intractability and the problems that are expected to be encountered in treatments uh, by the mental health professionals. Um, the inconsistent and even harmful practices continue with borderline patients. It used to be when I got started that psychoanalytic therapies were considered the primary, if not only, treatment which could be applied to a very difficult patient group and then under heroic circumstances, heroic clinicians might be able to salvage a few. That idea still persists and sadly the literature that that generation of psychoanalysts left behind um, perpetuated and actually amplified the idea of untreatability. Uh, some 54 books were published by psychoanalysts between 19 Seventy five and nineteen ninety, uh, every one of them documented the problems they encountered, the treatment resistance, the negative therapeutic reactions. There were no case reports indicating successful outcomes. So while the books were based on the idea that psychoanalytic of what you encounter in psychoanalytic treatment, the effects of it was to see even. Uh, worsen the idea that even these wonderfully trained psychoanalysts, what they were reporting was just uh, one problem after another. Um, practices continue to be inconsistent and often harmful. Amongst the more harmful things are that uh, clinicians withdrawal, clinicians hostility, um, the reflexive use of medications under circumstances where they're not likely to be helpful and frequently become harmful, and uh, the reluctance to diagnose people even when it's known to be there. And paralleling that is the inconsistent and sometimes even harmful training which, borderline, that which uh, the mental health professionals deliver. So against this backdrop, um, there has been the emergence of a generalist model for treating borderline patients. The first generation of evidence-based treatments um, generally picked a comparative treatment condition which was uh, going to be not very demanding. Uh, DBT was versus treatment as usual. MBT was versus treatment as usual. The one that made more of an exception was the initial trial with TFP, which compared it to a psychotherapy, a manualized psycho supportive psychotherapy, as well as DBT. Um, under these conditions, the index treatment, that one which was sponsored by the investigators, did considerably better than the alternatives. In the TFP model, that would change was not so dramatic, but nonetheless, TFB had some advantages which were really the focus of the attention and the interpretation of the results. And um, just, whoops, just to um, underscore an aspect of this is that these are resource intensive treatments. They require a lot of training, they require a lot of time professional time um, so that while they have each been championed by tireless and charismatic leaders, uh, it is very hard 
to extrapolate treatments which are this intensive and require this much training into an answer uh, to the public health needs. Uh, I think I read in some place like the New York Times maybe 10 years ago that DBT had reached maybe 5,000 people, um, the training, which was, of course, an impressive when you start out with these small workshops and you chew away and you chew away and you chew away. But still, uh, even if it's two, three times that, that's a drop in the bucket uh, considering the larger need for informed treaters for borderline patients. Any comments or questions so far? How am I doing on time? I'm about halfway through now, so. <laughs> Help me out here. <laughs> Um, so, um, again, after that first wave of treatment, uh, treatment studies, it now became unethical to have a compare. Uh, <laughs> you know, sometimes I feel that uh, maybe with all the apologies about shortening my time, <laughs> there's been a design at work here. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> um, uh, this, uh, it became unethical to compare one of these evidence-based treatments which had shown efficacy to a non-manualized, non-supported uh, treatment. So you had to develop a comparative treatment arm where it was had a rationale to it and the clinicians were doing something that was reasonable and um, manualized. And w what emerged out of that was less intensive, more supportive case management strategies. And this slide um, highlights four different studies where the index treatment uh, was then compared with something more along the line of supportive case management. And the transference-focused psychotherapy was not so case management oriented, but it was once a week supportive psychotherapy. In the cognitive analytic therapy, uh, it was compared with a case management therapy. With mentalization-based treatment, it was called structured clinical management. And then with DBT, it was what's was then called general psychiatric management, which enthusiastic because of the results shown got renamed good psychiatric management. <laughs> uh, the generalist model, the common features are that it's usually once weekly, it's quite supportive and commonsensical. There is not, these are not treatments with a whole lot of jargon associated with uh, any, anything that you need to learn by way of new language. Um, they flexibly use groups, medications, family interventions. They're generally psychodynamic and behavioral, and they focus on life outside of the therapy as much as or more than what goes on in the office between the patient and the therapist. This is a study that I uh, am most uh, um, affiliated with. This study was a multi-site study done in Canada under the leadership of Shelley McMain and my uh, longtime colleague Paul Lynx. Um, the general psychiatric management was based on um, uh, a condensation of the case management strategies from a book that Paul and I had recently finished on uh, good uh, clinical care of borderline patients more generally. And the results were that the outcome of what became good psychiatric management more or less equaled that of dialectical behavior therapy. Um, one of the more impressive things that followed the, this study was a, I got a phone call from Marsha uh, telling me about the results before I'd read about them. And of course, she said, suggested that uh, good psychiatric management was a poor man's form of DBT, uh, 
which I accepted as a compliment. Uh, uh, but um, uh, more impressive is that despite the failure of the DBT arm to show its usual superiority, what she reassured me is that the quality of the DBT in this study was first rate. That's impressive. And I don't mean, and I wouldn't want you to have a takeaway message, which is that general psychiatric management, good psychiatric management is equivalent to DBT. It is not meant to be, nor do I want anybody to misconstrue the message about my advocacy for generalist models of treatment. They're not here to replace the specialist models. They are meant to be the introductory level of care which all mental health professionals should be taught. This is what borderline patients should expect their treaters to know. And it's going to be good enough for most borderline patients. Those who fail, you kick upstairs to the specialist. I don't think there's going to be any lack of business for people doing the specialized treatments. I think what it will mean is there will be more discerning use of relatively uh, rare resources. So comments about the current training um, uh, for borderline personality disorder. Much of it, this is, I'm indebted to a colleague, Brandon Unruh, um, who has uh, surveyed this and more than surveying a broad literature, giving it a lot of thought. And uh, what he uh, identified is there are three extant models for training clinicians in treatment of borderline personality disorder. The usual, most common one, is that it devolves into the supervision of that psychotherapy arm of the Department of Psychiatry or uh, Psychology where the training is then subject to the idiosyncrasies of one's individual supervisors. And um, while increasingly supervision is being done by people with cognitive behavioral therapy, for certainly the last 20, 30 years in departments of psychiatry, it was largely done by people who had psychoanalytic or psychodynamic training. and. Um, uh, and within that, uh, there is a great deal of range in what was being super, what the supervision. Rarely was the supervision given by people who are primarily individual therapists, and that's their credentials and that's their experience, informed by the marvelous and modifications in our understanding about therapy with borderline patients that have come in the last 15 years. Second approach is what he called alphabet soup. That is, we are going to give our trainees an introduction to DBT. We'll have a three months curriculum on that or a three lecture curriculum on that. And then we'll give them a little in bit of introduction to um, mentalization based treatment. And uh, we'll introduce some basic cognitive behavioral. Uh, approaches to borderline patients along with some basic psychodynamic understandings of borderline patients, you get a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And you don't get any one model sufficiently taught that a, it will organize a clinician's thinking. They just become aware that it's complicated and uh, that if they want to do this, they're probably going to need a lot more training. And uh, the third is an introduction to specialist models. Now, at McLean Hospital, I think we have had uh, the luxury of having fourth year for residents electives where they can spend a year in MBT or a year in DBT. Uh, I was at the Columbia program yesterday where they have a year uh, program in DBT. And that is not, that's unusual, I think, in general to have that kind of option available. And while it seems like an enriched approach to the treating, uh, training treaters about borderline personality disorder, even there, there is insufficient uh, time and breadth 
for a clinician to actually develop much aptitude. What they may get is a taste for this, which they then want to pursue after graduation. In an effort to teach the generalist model um, called good psychiatric management, we have been conducting workshops. We do these when asked to clinical sites where there will be a sufficient number of clinicians who will are interested in learning. And uh, the people who come are generally self-selected because they so already have some interest in this field. Um, and we do those for day and a half, day or shorter for half day options. They use interactive cases, videotapes, and didactics. They emphasize general principles of treatment for lung patients and with uh, sort of how-to lessons on diagnosis, suicide, medication management. Uh, so far, we have done, I think it's 20, about 2,500 people have been associated with this. We just do them, and what uh, the model is that you get people at the sites where you're doing the training who want to become trainers, and then they become participants in the faculty, as was the case yesterday at Columbia, and then they take on the role of training other people so that it's a meant to be a sort of snowball effect where you treat, train trainers. More specifically, to train trainers, um, oh, this is a summary using the model developed by STEPS. Um, we examined whether these workshops have any effect, and they have more or less the same effect that was found with STEPS. Um, they decrease avoidance and dislike, increase optimism and a sense of competence. From my point of view, the, one of the more interesting and recurrent comments is when you get do these workshops, lots of times there's, a, in the audience, people who've been treating borderline patients for a long time. And they're there because they're interested in the area, I want to see whether there's something new. And what they generally say is, I don't learn too much, but I feel more confident about what I've been doing. And I like that statement because that's what this is supposed to do. You know, it took most of us 20, 25 years of mistakes to learn the basic good sense that's required to do well by these patients. So if you can expedite that and then get that done in a shorter period of time, that's what we'd like to do. Spare all those years of um, uh, pain for you and uh, failures for your patients. This again is from Brandon. It's a outline of an approach to residency training uh, one that has been adopted partly, but not entirely, at the Harvard system. Um, it is not easy to get a place in the curriculum for training about the treatment of borderline personality disorder. This contrasts with what I said earlier about the enormous public health significance, the fact that no psychiatrist is going to go through their life without seeing hundreds and hundreds of borderline patients but getting an equivalent space in the curriculum for training psychiatrists about how to treat them is an uphill battle. Uh, in our system, you start with teaching about the diagnostic phenomenology, the importance of your reactions to early encounters, what we used to call counter-transference, and the significance of monitoring it and uh, keeping uh, uh, comment and, and talking about it. We get uh, basic psychoeducation, which is part of good GPM, and I think that every clinician should know whether they want to treat borderline patients or avoid them. They, everybody should know about the work, about the prognosis and the genetics. And once you know that, once everybody knows that, it becomes more difficult than to withhold the diagnosis. You have something to tell people which is really important for anchoring their expectations and anchoring their understanding of the problems that they're having in their families. It's just for, it sets in motion a foundation which is irreversibly helpful. Mary did a study once, and 
uh, as psychoeducation as a uh, introduction to treatment, what she found is that the psychoeducation itself was very beneficial. Anyway, every clinician should know these basic facts about this disorder and be prepared, I think ethically obligated, to convey that to patients and their families. So anyway, that's in the year two. Year three, you discuss cases, supervision by generalists, hopefully. And then year four, uh, you get more advanced working with a team and taking on primary care. That's just a model. It's one that's been developed, thought about, and mainly implemented, but not entirely. A second approach we've taken to uh, training people is to have what's called training trainers workshops. Okay. <laughs> You're looking at me. <laughs> training trainers workshops. Um, here we ask uh, departments to send faculty members to, at not less than two, but not more than three, to come to a two or three day workshop where we involve the people who come in doing mock training. And then with the other trainers there to comment, we have residents, mock residents, who present the common problems that you encounter in supervision. And then we sit around and we'll, we rotate who's going to do the supervision until somebody gets in stuck so much that somebody else takes over. It's very interactive, it's very enjoyable. And people go away with a lot of energy about going back to their programs with the idea of um, introducing changes and upgrading the training there. Um, we've done two uh, in the Northeast, largely for Northeastern uh, schools, but people have come from overseas. Um, in two weeks, we're doing one at Northwestern, largely for um, centers in the upper Midwest. And then in s October, we're doing one at Shepherd Pratt. And so um, uh, we are looking for other sites to do this so that we get regional, gather the training faculty from regional institutions to come. They're free. We don't pay. So it's free and it's a very enjoyable experience. So people here who are in positions where you have an opportunity to influence the training at your institution and you think that they, uh, this would be welcome, let me know and then we'll make sure to mail you if and when we're coming to your area. Challenges and resistances, there's a, um, we started a newsletter um, uh, about for people who are trying to teach GPM and to de develop a, the program in their sites. The first one had to do with problems and progress. So we asked people from four different sites to give a reports on the problems they're encountering. And um, what you find is that in lots of departments there's a real hostility starting at the chairman's level. Um, against uh, spending too much time and energy on a disorder which they don't feel familiar with and which is not responsive to a biological treatment. Uh, as you all know, I think like more than 85% of American psychiatrists spend their time exclusively giving medications. Uh, in, with that kind of tradition and that kind of emphasis in training, it is sometimes difficult to find the space and make the space for something that primarily involves psychosocial learning and um, therapies. Uh, and then there's a basic passivity. I, whether it's borderline personality disorder or anything else, when you ask a system to change itself, it always means that somebody else is going to have to give up treasured space. It's like at NIMH, getting some space in there review committees for borderline personality disorder, well, they're all, every committee is stocked with people who are highly invested in their own particular arenas. And so uh, it's, very, it's very hard to create space there. And it takes a mandate from above more often than not in order to create the space 
for borderline personality disorder to get what it needs in residency curriculums. So let me cl close with this comment. Borderline patients, 15 to 20 percent of what mental health professionals uh, confront in our clinics, in our hospitals, they deserve to have professionals who know what they're doing. And it is, um, it is uh, tragic that our training system has not embraced this and integrated uh, training for this next generation. And that's where I hope a conference like this is going to continue to be a stimulus and that you all go home with uh, some fight in your bellies to get your, your bosses to ch change their habits. Thank you very much. It's really wonderful to be here, and I'm honored to have started this program. Ah, it's a wonderful so The question is, so if 9% of uh, emergency room visits are by borderline patients, what does good psychiatric management look like? Uh, Victor Hong from the University of Michigan uh, got very excited about just this question and has written a paper about it and has now begun to teach it in emergency rooms where he says it is people are remarkably receptive to it because emergency rooms are typically a place where the staff says, oh, no, how can we get rid of this person? So given a, a more a different attitude like that is, if you, if you lean in and say, what's the matter, the person's going to calm down, whereas you say, um, let's uh, just wait another 10 minutes, they're going to get worse. So there's basic sort of attitudinal things there that if you respond, the patient will calm down. If you don't respond, the patient gets worse. Uh, and not medicating and, and focusing on the life situations which preceded coming into without co raising the question f right from the start, well, should you, do you need to be in the hospital? Again, one of those ways of reflexively responding to a borderline patient in an emergency room, which is harmful, not helpful. Um, anyway, I can't tell you everything about it, but if you, and hi, I re recognize you. So um, uh, check with me and I'll make sh sure you get a copy of it. Yeah. Other? Three. <laughs> I'm going to use up my time. <laughs> Brad, yeah. So, John, if we try to promulgate this model, do you have any plans to do any more outcomes research to see the impact? Um, uh, any plans to do outcomes research to uh, uh, identify the impact? I have no plans to do that. Uh, if somebody wanted to do it, it would be great. I feel on a, it's so self-evident. <laughs> <laughs> That I, you know, I, I, I feel like my time is better spent as a missionary. Um, <laughs> yes. comment is that it is still persistent, even in a very sophisticated place like the host for this conference, uh, that um, w where the, the faculty, um, people in the inpatient units um, are, feel very resistant to giving the diagnosis. That's true at our institution. You know, we've been there for uh, ever. Well, I think that's why I feel we have to get this done in the training. That is, it's the next generation. It's hard to change the minds of people who are already have their habits formed.
but to get uh, dispel the misinformation and to provide a much firmer scientifically grounded basis for having realistic expectations and knowing, for example, the most common thing in the world. Borderline patients present with depression, they get treated with antidepressants. I mean, even if you wanted to treat the antidepression with antidepressants, the wrong class of meds. So, you know, um, we're just a lot of basic things. And, uh, you know, people don't know this. And I think that um, if we can get in on the training level, that's what I think. So one last question, yes. Paul. John, Eric, I love yeah. your generalist model. Yeah. And, 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 but one point you didn't make that I think is very important for us to hold on to about this kind of approach is that the Institute of Medicine report that came out last summer on psychosocial treatment and the future of funding and research in psychosocial treatment called for study of shared and non-shared elements of psychotherapy. And yes. you're talking in a generalist model about the shared elements of, of psychotherapy that yes. make good sense. It's very important that we start paying attention to that way of thinking, because that's, I think, the future of psychotherapy every month. Thank you, Eric. Okay.